Tanya, welcome to this week's class. I'm so excited to be talking to you and the community as well. We're talking about interview techniques to help you stand out as a podcast guest or host. And you are our talent today. So thank you so much for being here with us. I really appreciate it. I'm pumped and a little bit nervous with all these professional question askers. So this is going to be great. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully we're not putting you on the spot too much. Before we dive into this, I'd love to hear a little bit more about why you are talking about this. And I want to also mention that I've heard you referred to as like the media darling. Like I've heard that about you from multiple people. So I'd love to just hear a little bit about why we brought you here today. Obviously, I could tell everybody, but I'd like to hear from you directly. Yeah, well, you know, I love it when, you know, when you're interviewing other people, there's a really cool thing that happens in terms of you're immediately seen as the expert. So whether you're interviewed or you're interviewing someone, it's a really great way to build credibility. However, there's nothing worse as a listener, and I'm sure you guys have watched something on TV or you, you know, you've seen it on YouTube and someone's doing an interview and the, the person being interviewed gives a really great answer, but then the interviewer doesn't listen properly to that answer. And they're waiting for this follow-up killer question that's really going to get into all the, all the gems and all the gold and that question, it doesn't get asked. And so uh, I wanted to come on board here and teach you guys how to up-level your interview skills even more so, how to prep like a pro so that you're going to do an interview interview that when people jump on it's not ho-hum right it's high energy it's got great questions you're listening you're asking the questions in the minds of the audience and you're getting answers that haven't been given a thousand times because if you ask the basic questions you're always going to get the same answers and that's the difference between having your interview watched or listened to and having people come on and bounce and as, as uh, I think Brie was sharing just before, if you have a killer interview, you can then chop it. Like if you're videoing it, you can chop it into all these great little nuggets and teasers to drive traffic to whatever you are offering. So when it comes to the power of the interview, it is so brilliant for content and so brilliant for you to up level your credibility and your authority in the field that you're working in. Love it. I got two things to share. One, I'm super excited about what we're going to get into today, but two, I don't know if everyone noticed, but look at Tenya's background. I mean, come on, we're like background buddies here. Like, look at that. We got the same setup going on or close to it. So always great to see somebody else doing something similar, but uh, really excited to dive into this today. And I think the best place to start would be something that you just mentioned. You mentioned how there's kind of the, uh, like the, the mold that people fit into, right? As a guest you bring on or the host, like kind of our, our general direction that we can easily always fall into. First off, like, how do you really identify that? as either a guest or a host, like to be able to understand like, okay, this is the norm. How do I break out of this box? Because I think it starts with really understanding how to do that. Am I right in saying that? Yeah, totally. I mean, as an interview, I mean, I'm a, I'm a award-winning news journalist. I'm a former investigative news journalist and I've interviewed some amazing people. Um, highlight of my career, for instance, was like interviewing Muhammad Ali. And how many times has Muhammad Ali been interviewed? Now, as a journalist and as an interviewer, which you guys are in that role of, there's those basic questions that you always want to cover. You know, the who, the what, the why, the when, uh, the where, and the how. And as a journalist, when I'm interviewing someone, you know, I'm, I know that I've got to go through that mental checklist of who, what, why, when, where, and how. But that's just the, the veggies, right? That's just your stock standard interview. What you want to be thinking about and to up level is, and you want to do your research to do this, is, you know, what else can you ask to, to really get around those surface answers? Because when someone's being interviewed, they typically just tend to get those stock standard answers. But when you're a professional interviewer, you want to dig and dig and dig. And I know that my job as an interviewer is to keep asking questions until I actually find one that they can't answer because now I'm getting into new territory. And a really great way to do that, and, you know, when I'm doing my regular, because I do, I have an expert interview series and I run them in clusters. And one of my onboarding questions when people apply to be interviewed with me is I ask them for links to YouTube. I ask them for any blogs. I ask them for any links for um, any media that they've had. I ask them for any signature talk titles. Um, and then I also ask if they have a book. I ask them to send me a copy of the book. Do I read it? Absolutely, I read it. Now, if it's a really thick one, I'm just going to skim it, okay? I'm going to look at the table of contents. I'm going to try to find something that's going to interest my audience because that's the big 
thing here too. It begins long before you even start asking those questions. You want to make sure that the expert that you bring on is, of course, going to be a great match for your audience. And you want to get in the mind of your audience. It is our job as interviewers. We get access to people that we other people just don't get access to. And so we have a responsibility to ask the questions that are there in the mind of the audience because we have that backstage VIP pass. And so sometimes that can even be getting a little bit uncomfortable. We might have to get into a zone that we ordinarily, it might not be polite to go down that track, but we have the key to the gateway to access to ask these questions. So we have to be totally brave. We have to boldly go where no interviewer has ever gone before if we want to truly have a standout interview. So to give you credit toward that, Tanya, when, when you first, you interviewed me, this, this was months ago, I'm not even sure exactly when it was, but I look back at that interview and I was able to go back and realize that you asked me questions that no one else had asked me. And I'd been on at that, I don't know how many podcasts, but more than a hundred, probably under 200 though, but somewhere between there. And unfortunately we all kind of fall into just having our default answers. And I don't mean to, I try my best to keep it like really fresh for people, but it's hard to do if the questions come back in a similar rhythm that I'm used to hearing. Right. But I remember that when you interviewed me, there was a couple times where I like even paused, which is unlike me to have like a kind of like a pause, but I was like, Hmm, like, how do I answer that? Like, I haven't heard that before, but you're talking about really doing the prep work to be able to ask those right type of questions. And you mentioned actually reading somebody's book. Do you recommend everyone to like, if they have, if it's, they're interviewing an author to read the book, is that something you'd recommend to other people as well? Absolutely. I love watching TV interviews and you, and I'm sitting there going, did they read the book? Did they read the book? And you know, they've read the book because of the depth of the questions that they ask. And the minute that you, you're like, oh, wow, they've, they read the book. This is going to be great. Like it builds instant credibility too. And it might sound like, you know, oh, look, I'm, this is just kind of a hobby or, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But you can still consume portions of that book. And within that book, there will be um, beautiful sound bites. There'll be nice little clusters of information that you can look for, that you can dive deeper in. And another great way for preparation is to say they don't have a book or there's a, there's a ton of, um, they've got a ton of material. Right. And you and I, all of us here only have a limited amount of time. So when I'm asking my guests to send me um, things for me to review, to do my preparation, to bring them on as a guest, I'll say to them, what is the one thing that I need to watch or listen to? What is that one interview that, you know, really stands out that I need to go and consume? And I'll go and listen to it. I'll play it in the background and I'm listening. And quite often you'll hear the talent go down a track and it's fantastic. But again, the interview isn't listening listening now that's an opportunity for you because you can say you can mention you can say hey Alex I was listening to one of the interviews you've, you've done such and such and such and you touch very lightly on this topic and I'd love to hear more about that now here's a key pro interview technique pro so we have two types of people typically that go on interviews we have the verbose people like myself but I also know how to speak in sound bites because I speak in sound bites I can rein myself in but you guys, as the interviewer, you need to always be mindful. And I will often seek permission before an interview. I will say when we're in the green room, I'll say, hey, Alex, um, if I feel we're getting a little bit off track or I want to interrupt to dive and take the interview another way, is it OK if I interrupt you? So I'll seek permission to interrupt before I actually start the interview. Now, the other type of interviewer is the one, they're a nightmare. And I wonder who, who can resonate with this and put their hand up. They give really short answers and you feel like you're the CIA kind of trying to get all this information out. So what do you want to use here is you want to use body language, okay? And you want to use uh, words of encouragement like mm, meaning. Can you, can, you, can you tell us a little bit more about that? And then use the power of the pause. Don't be afraid to have an uncomfortable silence because when you pause shows the other person it's their, their turn to speak. But a lot of people are afraid of the pause. And here's the other thing about the pause too. Whoever is listening actually has control of the conversation. And you as the interviewer, you need to guide your person along to help them get where they want to go. And there's, there's obviously there's going to be key things that they want to hear. Like, for instance, if we're talking about interview techniques, what's the top three mistakes or the top, you know, we know that stuff, right? That's anyone can do that kind of interview. 
But so you want to cover those basic questions because that's what your audience is going to want to know. But listen within there to then take them into a genius zone to make your interview a standout interview. And so I'll keep probing. I'll, I might lean back. I'll watch my body language. I'll use the power of the pause to encourage them. I might even use a hand gesture to encourage them to speak. I've got a great example of this actually recently, Tanya, what, what you just shared was great. I'm a touch on first off the, the point of the, the pause. So when I first got started in podcasting, both as a guest and a host, I was really nervous about the pause. Like it feels awkward when you're just looking at someone over a screen, like in person, it's not as bad. Cause you can, for me, I, I can, uh, I guess articulate the body language a little bit better. And that's just a natural progression. But when it's over a screen, I feel like it just has to be super fast, right? Like no stopping. And when I started my podcast, I remember telling my wife, I'm like, I'm going to be the host that just is ready with the next question, not going to wait at all. And it was early on, I had one of my guests say, yeah, you, you started mentioning something I really wanted to talk about more, but we just kept on going. And that was when I realized it was my fault because I didn't leave any room. And that's something I've had to just learn to do again, both as a guest, as a host, because we have both sides of that, that puzzle here today uh, that are listening. And it's just so important to learn to do that really well. And, and a recent example, I actually had Mike Michalowicz on the podcast, who's Profit First is his book that he's most well known for. He had a new book out and I knew that he was doing, I think he was gonna do 200 interviews or something like that. And when I, I read his book, so to, to your credit, right? Like I read his book. And one of the points that he had in there was he barely touched on it just a little bit, but how to deal with like imposter syndrome or when you get bad feedback, when you're trying to be different with your marketing. And I asked him a question about it. And he gave me like a, a, an answer that Tanya, I know was the, the default answer. He's, he shared that on another hundred podcasts for sure. But instead of giving a response, I didn't say anything. And then he just started going. He, he was like, uh, so, you know, what that went, well, you know, what that meant for me, he like stumbled a little bit and then started going into like what that meant for me and shared like a really early example in his career about how he had to overcome people thinking that he was weird, thinking he was different when he was trying to market and ended up being the best part of our interview. It was like eight minutes of the interview and it was really powerful. And as a matter of fact, he's like, man, that was really different. Like I hadn't, hadn't gone down that path at all. And again, when he's doing 200 or so interviews on that same topic, that's what really separated it was being willing to stop and pause. So I think that's such an important point. And both as a guest and a host, we have to be willing to just slow down a little bit. And Tanya, something else you mentioned about that is it lets the, also, I think it lets the listener process. Like if you just nonstop talk, it's hard to listen and try to retain that information. But there's a pause, you're like, okay, I got that. Here we go. We're going to keep on moving. Uh, anyway, I know you have something to share there. So I'm gonna let you keep on going. I had another question, but I'll ask you that in a minute. And I love that. Look, like, like just, you're perfectly illustrating it too. You can see that I want to say something. So you have questions, but you're in the present, you're in the now. Um, and the other thing that I want to add to that is if the pause becomes a little bit awkward and it's becoming a little bit longer, sometimes I'll break the tension, but not move away from the topic. I'll just simply say something like, like if they're taking a little while, I'll go, yeah, it's a little bit of a tricky one. Just to, you know, I'll just give you a little moment. Like I will, it, so I, I want the, I want, I want the guests to feel comfortable and I want the audience to feel comfortable that something um, uh, coming. And I'm also going to speak to the elephant in the room. Don't be afraid to speak to that, right? So if someone's becoming emotional, like you might be covering, like with the, with the imposter syndromes, sometimes when you have a guest on, they haven't healed properly from their own journey, right? And they may have done 75 interviews on a topic. And I can speak to this myself. When I first started selling from stage, um, I lost it in front of a room full of people, like literally lost it. And, um, and then obviously I did some more healing and, and it caught me off guard, like 80 months down the track, someone asked me a question and I had to take a moment to, to collect my thoughts and gather myself because I felt all this weird emotion coming up from nowhere. And so if, someone, if I was interviewing someone like that, I would go, um, um, I'd go, yeah, it's a very, it's a very sensitive topic I know and I don't want to rush you here. So please do feel free to take your time. So I'll speak to the to the elephant in the room. I'm not ignoring what's going on. That also makes it much more conversational, much more casual. And when you have pauses and you say, look, take your time. I know this is a bit of a tricky one or this is a bit of a sensitive topic. Guess what happens? The audience leans in because it's now quiet. The way to command a room, if I'm speaking, selling from stage and the room is disruptive, I don't get louder. I get quieter. I wait. So you can hear a pin drop and the quieter you are, the room then comes to you. So using that power of the pause is also really, really good for engagement and connection as well. 
some powerful points there. I, I want to touch on one of these things, but real quick, going back to something, because I don't want to forget, because I think it's important. You mentioned speaking in sound bites. I'm, I didn't know what that was for a long term time. So I just would like you to give a quick definition of what, what that means, just in case someone else is saying, I'm not really sure what a sound bite is. Yeah, sure. So um, does anyone, I feel so old asking this question. Does anyone read newspapers? <laughs> Does anyone read magazines? Does anyone see YouTube video? Uh, anyone watch YouTube, right? So when you see a lead magnet, you see um, a promotion for an event, you see a video topic, it has sexy words, has a sexy, has a, a, a cluster of short words that have, that are really rich. They often paint a picture, okay? And so when we talk in sound bites, we want to speak like in headlines. So we want to, um, we want to get to the point really quickly and this can take practice too so what I encourage you to do as well is you can record yourself interviewing people like play your podcast back but you can also interview yourself and practice uh, speaking in sound bites and I guess if you were to get to the heart of what a sound bite is and please excuse I am Australian but please excuse my analogy here um, forget the foreplay, right? Just get to the good stuff. So when we speak in sound bites, there's no, in, in everyday language, it's there's polite conversation and we kind of beat around the bush to get to what we really want to know. And that's kind of the foreplay, right? And yes, when your guest comes on, your first two or three questions are going to put them at ease, right? You want them to feel relaxed. But then you want to get straight to the good stuff and you being interviewed yourselves when you're a guest on someone else's podcast, skip the foreplay, get straight to the good stuff. Every second counts. You know, something right along lines with that, like I had a friend of mine who he goes on a lot of podcasts every year and he said one of his goals is to be the shortest episode on every podcast he goes on. And at first I was like, okay, well, why? And he goes, because when someone new is coming to listen to that podcast, the first thing they do is they scroll through and find a short one. So they have like a lower barrier to entry or lower commitment. And I was like, okay, well, are you not having a good conversation? Like, how do you keep it short? And exactly what you just said, straight to the meat of it. Like no foreplay, just straight into the action, right? Like getting right into it. And I think that that's really important for all of us to do because people that are listening to podcasts these days, they, people are busy, right? Everyone's, everyone's got things that they want to do and things they're doing. So if you can condense what you're saying in a more bite-sized form that people can understand and follow, I think that that's a huge win for you and also for the listener. So uh, really a great point there. And I want to go back to this whole idea of prepping. And then we're going to get into some, I'm going to ask about great follow-up questions as well. But when it comes to prepping, is there a certain amount of time you say that someone should commit to it? Or is it different every time? Because I want to make sure we don't miss anything around the idea of prepping. Because I think that a lot of hosts specifically and guests, we're not taking the time to learn more about the other person or the other party involved in it. Well, I don't know, Alex, if you're asking the right person here, because I am a former investigative news journalist, but typically... Um, for any guests that I'm going to interview, I allocate 45 minutes of research time. That doesn't include reading a book, okay? That will include going to their website, going to their LinkedIn, going to their social media channels. I want to cover the basics, right? I want to make sure that my interview does have those basic questions. So I want to cover off on that because I'm thinking about why people are joining this interview and the basic information and the basic pains and challenges that they're going through that they want the answers to. So I want to cover off on those but then I want to I want to keep going because I want to find questions and I want to find um, elements within their expertise that I can ask fresh and exciting questions for so I'll, I'll do the social media as I mentioned I'll do the LinkedIn the websites as a general and then I'll start digging through their blogs right and I'll go I'll, I'll have a look at the first two pages for the most recent stuff and then I'll go into their archives I'll like dig on stuff that you know, they haven't talked about for a while, that perhaps there's been some changes in the industry um, or something that they covered off on a couple of years ago that's now relevant today. Um, so I'll allocate, yeah, about 45 minutes of time. I do always do an outline. So I will have some basic questions there. I, I always think before I interview someone, if I was listening to this, what would I want to know? What would I want to leave uh, this interview with? And when we talk about, I talked before about um, shy, people who are shy, and sometimes it's not that they're shy, but they're having an off day and the information that for some reason they can't access it. Don't be afraid to, to put content in the question. So you might say something like, hey, Tanya, I was listening to, uh, or I was watching, or I was doing my research or whatever about such and such. And I'd love for you to talk about 
da, 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 da. So you can put the content that you want them to cover inside your questions to help them get back on track as well. Um, but for me, the research, um, I love it. I love finding out about people. I'd love to find the story, right? So here's the other thing too about interviewing. Um, we, the brains don't remember facts, right? But uh, the heart does remember the story. So anytime you can, I mean, yes, there's always that kind of hero's journey story, but you want to dig into parts of that that are really going to resonate with your audience and encourage them to tell stories and give examples because that's what the audience is going to take away and remember. That's so good. You know, I'm thinking now about the the questions that you ask, right? You talked about what would the listeners want to learn from this or what, are they, what is it that they want to hear? And not just going into just a standard story arc, but really diving deep into it. And that brings me to the point of follow-up questions. So when, it, when a guest, let's say it's on that side, leads into something, uh, two, this is twofold because we have both people in the room here today. As a guest, how can you let the host know that this is somewhere, a path you want them to go down without directly saying it? And as a host, how can you really articulate, okay, this is something I should explore further. And doing that in real time is a bit of a talent and art, if you will, right? Yeah, it, it is. And so what I would encourage you to do um, when you're new to interviewing or you're wanting to up level your interviews is, I, you know, I've been interviewing professionally for a really long time, like 20 something years. So when I hear a question, I'll, or I hear an answer, I'll remember it and I can and I can circle back. And I'll often say, to, you know, in the interview, um, I love what you just mentioned. I'm going to circle back to that in just a moment, right? And then and then at a, at, at a time when we've just covered off on this, I'll go, now I just want to bring you back to such and such. That does a couple of things. Uh, number one, it keeps the audience engaged in listening because I've done something called a delayed void, right? A delayed promise. I promise to circle back to ask that question, which gets my audience listening in. I've also let that talent know that I'm coming back to that question, but I don't want to disrupt that thought. Now, how do you do that? Because there's a lot going on. You've got ground you want to cover. You've got to be here in the moment. Just have a notepad handy, right? You'll see people writing on TV. It's fine for you to be taking notes. And then you can come back and circle so you don't have to worry about remembering uh, what that person just said. So that can be a really great way to be in that moment, be able to follow those follow up questions that you've that you've given here. But when it comes to preparation uh, and you and you might have that list of questions, don't be afraid to throw them to the wind. If you start asking a line of questions and you're getting really amazing answers, keep going with what you are doing because that's going to um, make your interview stand out. Now, I'll often get people uh, who will say to me, look, can you send me a list of questions, right? Um, and people often say to me as an interviewer, oh, you know, do you want me to send you a list of questions? And I'm like, no, I'm fine with that. I can totally roll. Why? Because I have conversation um, segues. They're called bridging passages. So for those of you who are guests, if you get asked a question that you can't answer, you want to have these little bridging passages. So say... Um, say you are asking me a question uh, about lighting. Uh, Alex and I were just talking about lighting before we came on. Lighting isn't my area of expertise, right? Even though um, I do teach video, um, but I, I'm, my expertise is about content. So if Alex asked me a question about lighting, I would say, Alex, that is a really great question. And I can tell you right now, I have three point lighting um, and I have little crosses on the floor where everything's going to go because it's all been set up professionally. But lighting, honestly, isn't my area of expertise. But what is my area of expertise is content on video and how to make crushing videos that get more likes, engagements and shares. What did I just do? I honored the question. I didn't pretend I didn't hear it. I, I said, great question. I'm not an expert in that, but then I repositioned it and I said, but I'm an expert in this. And now we're going down the road that I want to go down. So when you do understand how to use these bridging passages, you as an interviewer, as well as an interviewee will have that confidence that no matter what question comes your way, you're always going to have an answer and you're always going to look great. Uh, and this is what um, this is what politicians do, which drives us crazy when we're watching. It's like, answer the question. You don't have to just acknowledge that question. You can also um, so you can you can send them their questions. And I do do that. But it has a big caveat um, on the page. And it says, hey, look, this is an outline of questions. But please do know these are not the only questions I'm going to ask you. Um, and I will be very much in the present, in the now, and I will be asking questions to follow up on what you are saying. But I'll send that to them and I'll have very gentle language so that they feel comfortable about coming on board. 
And I think it's great for you if, as an interviewer and even myself, you know, I've been doing this for so long. I still have an outline. Like I even have an outline today um, on things that I thought that you might want to hear from. And if the conversation doesn't cover them, that's cool. But that's there just in case any of us, right? Any of us can have that moment where the brain goes, oh, what was that? So we have the confidence knowing we have an outline there that we can just uh, we can just get them back on track. Two really big points right there, bridging uh, bridging passages, right? That's what you referred to that yeah. as, is that correct? Okay, really smart. I, I wanna drill into that a little bit more because when somebody's asking you the wrong questions, this is, this is the way that you get out of them, right? And I've correct. been, most podcasts that I've been on are fantastic, like amazing hosts, but occasionally I'll jump on one that they are just asking me the wrong thing. Like one of them one time was asking me about the mic setup and like the computer and stuff. And I know I, someone told me what to do. Like, I don't know, I don't know anything about this stuff, but I couldn't figure out how to, to change the conversation. Cause I didn't have this concept of bridging passages. And I just kind of was like, well, I know it's this and this person recommended it and start talking about it. When in reality, I should have said, well, what I'm better talking about. Right. So with these bridging passages, is this something that you've predetermined that, you know, like here's five of them that I have, or is it something that you just get really good at making up on the spot? Can you give us a little bit more on that? Yeah, I have about five of them. Okay. Right? I'm very happy I can send them to you and you can share them with your people. Um, I've, yeah, I've got five of them. One of my favorite ones, because I often get a question of, what if I don't want to talk about that? Or um, um, there might be something litigious going on in the background, like family-wise, custody fights and that kind of thing. What if I don't want to talk about that? Um, so another great bridging passage is, um, if you would ask me a question about something and it was personal and I didn't want to go down that track, I would say, you know what, Alex, that's a really, really great question. And I wish I could answer that for you right now. Unfortunately, there's some sensitivities and some legalities around that involving other people that prevent me from sharing that with you today. But please do know um, that as soon as that has been resolved, I would love to come back and share that with your audience first. What I can talk about today is blah, blah, blah. And you notice how my energy changed? I, I took that little pause and I went, what I can talk about today, and so now I've directed the conversation. So I didn't ignore the question that was coming to me. I honoured the question, very important. I then said there's some issues outside of my control involving third parties, right? So now it's not my fault I can't talk about it. So now the audience understands. And now I've given your audience a reward and said, hey, look, the minute I can talk about this, I'm going to come back and share that with your audience. They'll be the first to know. What I can talk about today is, and then I march them off in the direction that I want to go. So when you have these conversation um, techniques, you can use them all the time. Um, like for instance, another one, and I, I curse myself ever teaching my daughter these. Um, another one that you might not want to, if you don't want to talk about something as well, you might go, you know, look in the, in the time that we have today, you know, to go into all the mic settings and all the technicalities. I mean, it is a whole other subject on its own. Uh, and at the time that we have today, unfortunately, I don't have the time to go into that level of detail right now. However, what I can go into in the time that we have, because I want to make sure your um, audience has some takeaways is, and then you direct them again. So I once told my daughter to clean her room and she goes, mommy, in the time that we have right now, I'm sorry, we can't talk about that. But what we do have time to, so it's just directing, it's, it's called the distraction, right? And the redirection technique, and it's incredibly powerful. I love that your daughter ended up using that against you. That's fantastic. What was I thinking, Alex? She's, she's obviously I... brilliant. She's she's a, <laughs> she's a journalist in the making. Um, that's that's great. Uh, going back now to to having an outline because I also wanted to talk about that a little bit. I think that's great as a guest or host. So if if I'm going to have an interview with a with a guest, I read their book like you're saying. I do all that. I make sure I have an outline. I don't ever read it, and very rarely do I even go through what I wrote down. But it at least gives me the ease of I'm prepared. Worst case scenario. And I do that when we be a guest as well. I always make sure that like, even if the host gives me nothing at all, I go listen to their, their podcast and I might realize, oh, they ask the same five questions at the end every time. I'm going to be ready for those five questions. So I'm like, uh, what? You know, like, uh, so I, I go through and do all that. But what happens if you have an outline and you bring a guest on your show, let's just say, and they are answering everything completely wrong. Like it's just not going the direction that seems to be beneficial for the audience at all. Is there a way to bring it back or is it best just to be like, this is just not going to go anywhere? Uh, that's something I've always struggled with. I'd love to hear your opinion on something that's just not going the way that you imagined or that you think is healthy. Now that's a great question. Um, 
it would it would really depend on what's going on right so um I do encourage anyone to do this who is interested in in up leveling the interview skills I read body language okay so I've I've read about body language I've trained with body I've trained with one of Australia's top body language experts so I'm not just listening to their answers but I'm watching their body language as well so I will look to see if I can disrupt their behavior I will look to see if I can ask an easy question to get their energy to change but honestly Alex there's only so much you can do if the other person is I don't know having a really bad day and they're really not asking the question answering the questions you can ask open-ended questions but at the end of the day sometimes you just got to cut them loose um, and it becomes a sacrificial interview. Now, I would say honestly that that is the, uh, a very, very small minority. And typically, if you can change the energy, if you can watch them, so if they're, if they're kind of like um, defensive techniques, right? So they might be, um, you know, covering their mouth or, or you can just kind of see them getting a little bit uncomfortable or crossing their arms or something, just back off a little bit and go into something that you think they'll be a little bit more comfortable answering and see if you can save the interview that way. Or, and you'll know this from your research, if there's a hot topic that you know they love to talk about, you can always come back to that hot topic where they feel comfortable and then gently push them out again. But if they're going to be a diva, I'm going to cut it short and I'm not going to interview, I'm not going to invite them back on. <laughs> I'm glad that you said that side of it because I think so many of us, we especially as hosts, we we don't want to to do the interview and not post it. But if it's not good for the audience and it wasn't valuable, you're better off doing that. Uh, in my in my time of interviewing people, I think I'm at 100 and I think I've done 160 interviews or something like that, and I've had four. So like you're saying, the minority for sure. Only four of them that just weren't good. And, and when the first one happened, I struggled with it for weeks of like, should I post it? It was a big guest but it wasn't going to add value. So you just have to come to terms with the fact that, you know what, it's a conversation that you had, maybe it was recorded. But for me, those four interviews, I'll never post them just because I know that I have to protect the audience at the end of the day, the people have trusted me with their time. I can't give them something that they didn't ask for. And I have to be really careful with that. But I'm glad that you also kind of gave permission to all of us to just say, sometimes that just happens, although it is rare. Yeah. And the other thing too, is um, I'm a real stickler and you'll know this, Alex, I, expect all my guests to hop on 15 minutes early why do oh, yeah. i do that? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and you'll get a reminder um i do that for a couple of reasons i do it because i want to check their camera setup right because i i video record it, you know if, even if it's for a podcast you'll pull the audio but i i, I want to repurpose it right i want to multi-stream it so i'm going to check their camera setup i'm going to help them get their screen at the right level i'm going to get them to turn or turn off lights we're going to do a mic test and also in that 15 minutes, I'm just going to hang out with them and let them know what we're going to be talking about. I'm going to let them know that I have their um, call to action. I'm going to confirm that that's the right um, place that, that they want to direct people to. So also you're know, preparing for a great interview is also making sure your guest isn't on last minute because, you know, if things aren't right, if the camera's not set up properly, the framing is off. All those things do count towards people watching and having, you know, eyeballs on you and hanging out with them for just those few minutes before and going through a very basic outline. And I will often ask them, hey, look, I've got a list of, you know, questions and I sent them through to you, but is there anything in particular that's come to mind this morning that you'd really like me to ask you about? So I'm looking for ways in that green room to build rapport and put them at ease to also minimize the chances that they're going to freeze when they get on camera uh, or we're going to have a bad interview. So the preparation before you go live or you hit the record button is also really important as well. Tenny, I'm seeing a trend here. The preparation is pretty much key to having a good interview. And I actually remember when, when we recorded together, I came, I showed up 15 minutes early. I was on time. Um, and you, you mentioned things that were that I was posting about like on my personal social media. So it wasn't like when we hit record, I felt like at that point, I was just talking to a friend because you actually dove into those things. And I we were really comfortable together at that point. It was like, oh, I'm good to go. And sometimes people will just be like, okay, hey, you ready? Okay, good. Like I had that last week, a guy was like, as soon as I got in, it, we weren't talking for 15 seconds. He's like, hey, uh, did you get the Zoom link all right? And stuff, yeah, good, cool. I'm gonna hit record, record and we started. I was like, whoa, whoa, so fast. The, the rapport of even just five minutes, 15 is great. But if you can only do five minutes, anything helps to break the ice to get make it a more, okay, I know this person, I can have a, an open conversation with them. I think that, that is so helpful if you're able to do that. 
Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, we talked about no foreplay with the interview, but when it comes to actually going to do the interview, we want foreplay in the green room, right? We want to, we want them to feel comfortable. And then the other thing I want to mention, because you mentioned, Alex, that we have people joining us who either have podcasts or a guest on podcasts. I'm going to be bear cop here for just a moment. And that is that, yes, as expert interviewers, it is our job to ask really great questions. However, we are not experts uh, in your industry like you are. So we can, we can do all the preparation, we can do everything to set ourselves up for success, but we still need a little bit of a hand. We don't, we might go down an alley and you've got this wealth of information and we don't know. So you as an interviewee, you as the person being interviewed, your interview will only be as good as the answers that you give. And it is actually not the job of the interviewer to know what questions to ask to get at that information. Yes, I'm not saying don't do your prep. You need to do your prep, but you're still not an expert in that topic like the person being interviewed. So when you are the guest, help them out, help them help you do a great interview by giving great answers. What do I mean by that? Well, another bridging passage might be, let's say, for instance, you've given an answer and the interviewer didn't realize the wealth of gold behind the question and the answer that you've just given. And there's more to that. They also might not be listening because a lot of people don't listen. They're thinking about what to ask next. And that's like you've got to be in the, in the now as much as you can. So if you are being interviewed, or even if you're an interviewer, if I hear someone ask a question or I'm giving an answer and I'm interrupted, I'll say, Alex, just before we move on, I just want to mention, right? So you can use bridging passages. Let's say you hopped on to promote something and that hasn't come up in conversation yet. You could say, just before we finish up today, Alex, I just want to mention. So you can use these bridging passages to also offer up gold yeah, the interviewer, through no fault of their own, they've done all their homework, through no fault of their own, they didn't know the question to ask to unleash that gem. So help them help you and give really great answers, even if you're not asked the optimal question. That's great. And the flip side as a host, you've got to be listening because I fall into the trap of just wanting to read off my next question, even because I can, I'll listen far enough to know, okay, it's, it's the right direction. So I can ask my next question. And I'm sitting there trying to memorize the next question by like looking down here in the corner. Like I'm not even looking at the person, I'm looking down here. Uh, I, I do have a tendency to look at the screen more. I need to, I need to look at the camera, but, um, but in general, you've got to make sure that, that you're actually listening because there might be a gem there, like you're saying. And Tanya, you've seen on TV, you've seen it everywhere where a guest or someone being interviewed will like lead off, like almost be like, here, ask me about this. And the person interviewing them just is like, nah, so about this. And I've heard some things where I'm like, it was so clear that I'm like, wait, 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 we all want to know what, what was that that they were about to say? Like, you just had to say, oh, can you expand on that? Right. But it's because people aren't listening and I get it. It's, it's nerve wracking. It takes practice to listen really well. But I think all the best interviews I've ever heard on podcast are when you can tell the host is listening. They know they don't have all the questions or the answers, but the guest has what they need. And their job is just to kind of draw out of them as best as they can. Those are the best of the best I've found. Yeah. And you can use, um, because I mean, everything you said is right. It can be nerve wracking and you are kind of conscious of wanting to make sure you've got great content and a great interview, but you can use stall tactics, right? While you're, because you are in the now and you're wanting to um, dive in and, and ask more probing questions or something's been um, answered, you can, you could use a stalling tactic. You can say something like, it's a really interesting point that you raised there. And I just want to go into that a little bit further. And as you're saying that, right, you're, th you're gathering in, in your mind your next question. So everything that comes out of your mouth doesn't have to be the, the very next question. You could have these little kind of natural conversation pauses in there to cut yourself a break. So I'll, you know, my mind is so active. I'll have like kind of a gazillion things and I'm trying to, I'm trying to be in the present and I'm thinking about the next question. So I'll just take a moment myself and I'll go, you know, Alex, you know, that was a really great point that you made. And so I'm just wondering, I'm just wondering, and then I'll dive into my question. So I will give myself permission and space to take a little pause and again if you do happen to watch the news and you're forgiven if you're not a news junkie like me but if you watch them if you're like um oh i'm trying to think of that gentleman's name on cnn um with their gray hair uh anderson cooper 
You'll see him all the time, pause, drum his fingers, look away. He's thinking about that next question. Now, if professional interviewers can do it and we don't turn away because it's like, what is he going to ask next? We can do it too. The way that you just led that up, by the way, was was interesting to me. Like if I was listening to that and you're like, that's a great question. I've got, I've got more to go on with that. Like if you do, if you were to do that and we were in an interview, I would be very intrigued, right? Because it's like, oh, wow, what are they going to ask next? And like you're saying, it work, if it works for somebody who's a professional top of their game and they can do it, then all of us can. It can be a little bit uncomfortable initially, but as we get more experience with that and continue to get the reps in, it gets easier and easier. And honestly, I think it, it calls for better engagement because the listener now is wondering like, ooh, what's, what's next, right? It, it's, not, it's not known. If you jump straight to another question, then the listener can follow pretty easily. But if they, you get through that little variable in there of like, ooh, let's dive into that further, I think it's really helpful. Um, Tanya, this has been great. I, I know we we're short on time here. I'm like looking at the time. I, there was one more thing that I wanted to ask about. So it's just kind of like a random question here. But what do we do with somebody who's dominating a conversation, uh, whether it's on the guest or host side, but usually it tends to be the guest will try to, to not, not even try to, they will just be a dominative person when they're speaking. What do you, what do, you do with something like that? Another great question. Um, you, I mean, the audience is there to hear the guest, right? Um, and that's also why as an interviewer, we want to speak as little as possible, which can be very frustrating because sometimes they, you, you actually might know more on that part of that topic and you try to get them to, to unlock it. But you've got to remember that you are the conduit, right? You're not the talent. They're the talent. The audience hasn't tuned in to watch you per se. They've tuned in to get the expert, the, the uh, advice from the expert. If someone is really, really verbose, I would say something like, Alex, I, I hope you don't mind if I just interrupt you just, just, uh, just a moment. I love what yours, I love what you're talking about there. Um, and we've got a lot of ground to cover. So I want to circle back if we have time. Um, right now, I want to cover this topic. So I will direct the conversation. I will interrupt. I've already asked at the beginning of the conversation. I'm now going to ask again so my audience doesn't get angry with me. Because if you keep interrupting, the audience is like, Tanya! We didn't tune in to hear you, right? So I want to speak to the unspoken objection, the elephant in the room. I want to say, Alex, look, Alex, 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 just a moment. I'm, Alex, I love, I love what you're talking about, just there, right? So I'm going to compliment this. I'm not the bad guy. And and if we've got time, I want to circle back and go into that further. And if we don't, maybe we could even get you on again. But I've had some questions come in from my audience that and that. That may or may not be true, right? But I'm just trying to make it like the good guy. I've had some questions come in and I really want to make sure that we cover off on those. So let's just hold that for, for just one moment and blah, 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 blah. Then I'll ask my next question. Now the audience isn't, isn't angry with me. Um, and if that person keeps speaking verbose, I've only, if I do it that way, because here's the thing, and this is like media training. When you are interviewing someone, when you are the interviewee, I should say, whether it's on a video, whether it's on live TV, whether it's pre-recorded TV, you are there to connect with the person at home who is watching you. So if you're an interviewee and the person interviewing you is a little bit confrontational, as long as you're cool and calm and you answer the questions, blah, 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 you know, initially when someone starts grilling someone in an interview, the audience loves it. But if they keep it up, the audience doesn't like it and they start to be on your side. And that's what you always want to be mindful of. So if I've interrupted that person once or twice and I've made it in the audience's best interest as to why I've disrupted them, and I do that once, twice, maybe even three times, the audience is going to start to not care for that person. Now, that's not ideal, but I'd rather them be on my side so they come back and they watch the next um, uh, interview, and I simply wouldn't get that guest on again. But make it so that you're being polite in the uh, interruption, don't be afraid to interrupt. You've already sought permission. You're going to seek permission again publicly this time so the audience knows you're not just being rude. And then you're going to redirect the conversation with a caveat that if there's time, you'll circle back and go down that rabbit warren that they're trying to take you down. I love that. It's really super helpful. Thank you for sharing that. And for sake of time here, because we want to get to the Q&A with, with everyone who's in attendance today. But Tenny, this has been so helpful. I just want to ask, do you have any final thought on this idea of interview techniques and standing out as, a, as an interviewer or interviewee? 
Yeah, I mean, if you're doing it on video in particular, you want to, um, you obviously want to dress for the audience, you want to make sure your framing um, is set up and you want to stand out. So I intentionally chose an animal print today because I wanted you guys to remember the loud, crazy Australian woman in animal print. So I intentionally chose what I was wearing for this audience. So you want to think about being memorable. And obviously you want to make sure as much of that tech as possible, but truly the, the difference with being a standout interviewer to a regular interviewer is not getting those stock standard questions to, to do your preparation, to listen and to be in the now, uh, and to use that power of the pause and encourage conversation, as well as take control of that conversation. And you can, and I see some interviewers do this, I tend to not do it so much. You can ask, um, there are often more people will ask, you know, when you were younger, what would you say to a younger version of yourself? I kind of think that's pretty stock standard. But there are other versions of that that you could do to, to try to elicit different responses um, from your subject. So I love to talk to people about, you know, um, was there a time when you when you were trying to learn this that you really felt like giving up? And then I'll pause. Why am I doing that? Because I know there's people watching this that feel like giving up. So think about the unspoken objections, the unspoken questions, the pain points of your audience and layer them into your interview. And you'll have a truly um, engaging interview. And here's the other thing too. Um, you're, like I use a little bit of hands, but I don't go crazy hands because I'm on video. Also understanding that when you are speaking on video, and this is also very, very important with your podcast, right? Your tone of voice. So you want to bring more energy. So if you were to sit opposite me here, I'm kind of like this. I'm actually quite a quiet person and I'm an observer, not much of a speaker. But if you see me on video, I'm very different, right? So you want to think, it's not that I'm not being uh, authentic. It's just that I'm adding extra energy because the camera adds as a filter. All these things add to a video that's watched to a video that goes. And you'll see people, they do expert interviews and there's no energy and it's like I'll spend like five seconds and I'm like, oh, you know, yawn because I'm not it doesn't help me feel good about myself. I'm not interested in it. So so bring that extra energy, dress for your audience, dress to be memorable, set everything up because sound, uh, video, all that does matter. And when you when you is it worth it? It's totally worth it because people will love your interviews. They're going to watch the replays. They're going to want to be a guest and all that really good stuff. Last thing as well, I just want to mention high profile um, uh, uh, interviewees. So um, I was working um, as an editor um, for a, 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 a very um, high level financial website a few years back. And I had Ryan Dice agree to be interviewed. Now, for those of you who don't know Ryan Dice, he's kind of a big deal in the online launch world and content marketing. He owns um, Digital Marketer, um, very, very successful guy. It's very hard to get an interview with Ryan. So I leverage my ability to get access to high profile people and I involve my audience. So the first thing I did when I secured that interview was I did a social media post. Hey, guys, I'm interviewing Ryan Dice. What's the number one thing I must ask him? So I involve my audience in asking questions. It's kind of, it is definitely cheating, um, but you will get some great questions when you ask your audience. If you could sit down with Ryan Dice, what would you want him to help you with? What's your number one burning question? And then I add those in. These are some helpful tips you brought at the end. Thank you. That last one's very, I, I've taken a lot of notes throughout, by the way, I've got like a whole whole side of my screen is just covered here, but I really like that last one. I've never leveraged that idea of en engaging my audience in the way of letting them feel like they have a buy-in with a question. Cause anybody who submitted a question is going to listen. Cause they want to know, Ooh, is Tanya going to ask the question that I recommended, right? Like everyone's going to listen. It's a great idea. And, and like and, uh, you said, you get some good, you get some good questions. You do. And just a quick, uh, if you want to up level it, and I'm just mindful of different levels people are at, but I'll often, if I'm just doing an interview with someone on a topic that I know really resonates, I will, e and they're not high profile, I'll still email my database and say, hey, I've got Alex, and I did this with you, Alex. Hey, I've got Alex coming on talking about podcasts. What's the number one thing I must absolutely ask Alex? And if I could over deliver, what's the other thing I could ask for? But now this does take some preparation, but what I did was I collected those questions. I did it about three days before I was due to email Alex. And then I used StreamYard. So what I could do was I could put the question, who asked it and where they came from with the question on screen. So now we whole up leveled it because not only is there question being asked, 
but they're being uh, given um, uh, acknowledgement on screen. So there's visual and it looks so professional because it's very clear that you prepared ahead of your interview. Very cool. I love that. I'm going to use that one myself. Thank you for that. It was a great bonus at the end there. Before we end the recording, um, can you just let everyone know where they can find you? Yeah, absolutely. So you can find me on social media, Tanya Target Camacho. I'm on Instagram, LinkedIn, and Facebook. Um, and is it okay to share my invitation? Yeah, Alex? please do. Yeah. And especially if you have a link, drop it in the chat for sure. And I'll link to it I in the do. show notes. If you guys have had fun and you want to come and hang out with me, I actually have, I, I run pop-up masterminds and it's a pop-up mastermind because they're unscheduled, um, but it is limited. There is an application process because I can only put six people in the room with me, but it is free. You can come and hang out. We have a hot seat. So you can ask a burning question. It might be about podcasts. Please don't ask me about microphones. Um, <laughs> it might be about video, whatever it is that you need help with. I encourage you to come and hang out with me, apply to join uh, one of my pop-up masterminds. Um, and then we can continue this conversation and have some fun. Love it. Tanya, thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate your time. You're so welcome. Thank you for having me. Awesome to meet you all guys.